All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is John Servos, and I'm the Director of Commercialization Education at Fast Forward Medical Innovation, uh, also known as FFMI. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, which is number four, if you've been following along in our six-part series with the Department of Internal Medicine here at the University of Michigan. Uh, before we get things started, I do have a few technical items I'd like to cover. Uh, if you have a question today, please feel free to type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, our staff will be monitoring the Q&A as well as the chat function during both presentations today. Uh, and we'll be sure to, to link, any, link to any resources that are discussed today uh, so that you can follow along. I'll also note that uh, the presentation is being recorded and we plan to send a, uh, a version of the recording along with slides uh, and uh, an opportunity to take an evaluation all post program via email uh, later today. Today's webinar is titled Digital Health Technologies, Software and Mobile Apps, where we will be discussing the development pathway of digital health technologies and highlighting some unique considerations along the way. As I mentioned, this is a, a sponsored webinar series with the Department of Internal Medicine, and today's webinar is in particularly supported by U of M's Innovation Partnerships Group uh, as well. Uh, I would suggest that you visit our website uh, or in that post-event email, we can uh, link to some of the remaining webinars, uh, including one on biomedical devices, uh, as well as additional resources and funding opportunities uh, for those of you that are working on uh, commercializing uh, a project. So with that, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, first, you will hear from Drew Bennett, who serves as the Director of Software Licensing and Research Partnerships uh, at University of Michigan Innovation Partnerships Group. Uh, following Drew, you'll hear from Michael Lanham, who is an Associate Chief Medical Officer and Assistant Professor uh, of both Learning Health Sciences and OBGYN. So thank you both for being here, uh, and I will turn things over to you, Drew. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, as John said, my name is Drew Bennett. I'm with the Office of Innovation Partnerships and lead the software practice there. I'm happy to be uh, doing this webinar today with uh, Dr. Lanham and uh, our friends at FFMI. Always great to partner with them. So I'm going to go through a, a number of different things, hopefully one of the takeaways, at least from my side of the conversation, is just uh, to generate some enthusiasm for the variety of things that can be done, raise some um, thoughts around some of the foundational aspects of what really goes into digital health opportunities, and uh, talk about some case examples. There's lots of great stuff that's actually been done here at Michigan. Some people have varying levels of awareness around this. Uh, I always like to highlight them because they're really, really interesting, um, cool type of applications in digital health. So it's not uh, completely uh, theoretical. There's lots and lots of good things going on here. So hopefully uh, that's valuable to everybody. And per John's comments, certainly feel free to ask questions. That's what we're here for. This is intended to be, as the title implies, uh, an introduction, but certainly something to help people understand. So. Just by way of backdrop to hopefully understand who Innovation Partnerships is. Innovation Partnerships basically works hand in hand with other partners across campus, such as FFMI, to help facilitate the transition of really high quality research that's done here at Michigan out into the marketplace through the translational research process. Our big uh, primary uh, responsibilities are around working closely with PIs around intellectual property protection and then helping to facilitate uh, commercialization through licensing and translational research development. So these are some of our statistics. Everybody likes to thump their chest a little bit. The good news for you is that you have a great uh, support mechanism through uh, partnerships such as FFMI, as well as our office. We do a lot of stuff. Uh, the University of Michigan is fortunate to be one of the handful of institutions across the country that, that does the volume of work that we do, and that's a direct result of the innovation and expertise at Michigan. Really, that process in a nutshell is represented by this graphic. At the front end of it, we're trying to work with you to evaluate what we have, determine what the uh, potential protection strategies are, what's the market for what uh, you're doing from a work standpoint, and then move it through that process of development and release into the marketplace. So 
again, all those translational activities, lots of great programming such as this education wise, lots of good funding mechanisms across camp campus to help you uh, develop your product, lots of mechanisms to uh, reduce that risk, gain feedback, understand what the market needs, and hopefully end up with a solution that really uh, solves a problem in the marketplace. So bottom line, we're really here to help uh, translate that uh, activity from the bench to the bedside and really have a big impact with you in the marketplace. So from a foundational standpoint, you know, we've been uh, working closely with FFMIA and the medical school for a long, long time. I've been here going on 11 years now. And if I really had to look at digital health and say, what's the primary foundation of it? It really comes down to analytics. It's basically those activities now that we're capable of doing based on consuming massive amounts of data and really starting to apply that in a clinical setting or an operational setting to change healthcare. Um, if you walk away with any other uh, takeaway from my presentation, it's really to understand the premise from which this starts. So it's really access to that data, starting to analyze it, interpret it, and then apply it on a forward basis uh, to the clinical setting. Again, sometimes these things, and we'll talk about some examples, are very operational. So they have to do with things that uh, are more on the mechanical aspect of running the healthcare setting. A number of these things are absolutely applied to clinical situations. So they're diagnostic things, they're uh, prescriptive things. And then there's a lot of things that are um, outside of the health system, telehealth not being the the least uh, obvious of them that has changed substantially in the last five years, certainly since the pandemic, something that many people would have thought was on a slow roll has certainly uh, been rapidly accelerated as a result of that. So when we think about it, let's really think about ana uh, analytics and data as those foundational pieces to get a digital health solution off the ground. So it's, um, it, as, as has been said by lots and lots of people, uh, you know, Data is the new oil in many ways. Uh, it is kind of the foundational gold for a lot of activities, not the least of which certainly being in the healthcare setting. So when we think about it, you know, the most obvious thing is the electronic health record, what sits in Epic, the EMR uh, here at Michigan. But there's tons of other things that are part of those foundational aspects that lead to a really um, significant change in what we're doing from a digital health standpoint, and not the least of which in that, that category have to do with sensors, the ability to essentially pick up signals that we were never able to see even as uh, little as 10 years ago. It doesn't take uh, too many examples to appreciate how that it was changed. 10 years ago, you couldn't have a, a sensor sitting on your wrist that was fundamentally able to detect you know, um, cardiac anomalies, you know, now you can have an eye watch on your wrist. It's going to tell you if it's picking up AFib, almost unheard of in, in a, in the near past. And of course, on the back end of those things are a number of things that have to come with that. The ability to generate that data is one thing, the ability to compute against it and actually drive results, uh, has, uh, been assisted by things like massive compute capacity in the cloud and, emerging tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then really the economics associated with that and the willingness to invest. Um, talk a little bit about kind of some, some things here that are uh, emerging areas in the healthcare space. But EHR adoption, if I were to highlight anything in that mix of things, certainly is the foundational piece. And the, the only thing to take away from the slide is really uh, the adoption rate of the EHR through the uh, various changes in legislation over the last several years has made a huge difference. That the fact that we have this data over the longitudinal uh, sweep of uh, a patient's lifetime uh, in pretty much every setting, whether that's a clinical application, in hospital setting or an out of hospital situation are uh, really, really massive, massive changes. So the EHR is something that's that's really been the fuel to a lot of the digital health activity. Again, on top of that, just a massive, massive amount of sensors, whether it's things like um, blood glucose sensors that are now very common, people running around with um, um, 
fib detection or EKGs on their wrist, um, everything, motion sensors, um, CSAT sensors that people have at home that you can get for very, very cheap uh, uh, inertial sensors of any kind. They're all over the place. So the, the services market is huge. It's getting bigger. Uh, and the artificial intelligence market, so the ability to compute on top of all of this data, whether it's gathered from the EHR or sensors, starts to build that story of how digital health solutions come about. And in the US, it uh, is particularly um, important to remember that, that the amount of spending from a GDP standpoint that's associated with healthcare is just huge. Um, th th these numbers are a little bit dated at this point in time, but you know, 18% of GDP is a really, really, really huge number. Three and a half trillion dollars um, tells you what that upside opportunity is. And certainly when we look at that, the reason digital health in particular becomes probably a more unique and interesting opportunity is the fact that there's the uh, possibility of changing via digital health solutions, telehealth, remote sensing, um, in the hospital sensing, uh, that cost um, ratio can be changed dramatically. So certainly a lot of front end investment, but the opportunity to see some things change significantly is really why there's a lot of excitement around this. Um, just a couple of quick slides on AI and machine learning and deep learning. You know, it, most people have a general sense for this as far as the constellation of things there, but all three of these, all broadly in my um, estimation, are the are now the foundation for most of the current exciting um, digital health solutions. They all have some aspect of it that. Um, AI and machine learning are looking at this trove of data and fundamentally changing the way we're doing care. So they're assistive in the sense of consuming a lot of data, boiling that back to something that's usable from a clinical standpoint, and then driving a change in care, hopefully, uh, with respect to everything from diagnostics to longitudinal tracking and treatment uh, and, and operationally as well. And again, if you look at these very specifically and examples where they're being applied, we know them to be applied right now, things such as ML being applied in logistic regression um, and trying to evaluate skin lesions. Is this thing benign or is it malignant? Very, very specific known case where, again, ML being applied to evaluating a lesion and determining the status of that. Um, and then as we move into the deep learning type of things, Lots of deep learning activity being applied in image analysis. So detecting everything from a tumor to fracture detection to intravascular uh, bleed characterization, things of this nature. So all these things um, previously were done by an expert who's looking at it and doing some type of assessment. Now it's assistive in the sense that it can be quantitative, giving you a better um, a detailed understanding of what these things are, and then allowing you to understand things such as how treatment is uh, affecting the results. I'd say the other thing that comes into this mix is really what is going on with digital health. And there's just a tremendous amount of activity in this. I you know, read this morning, CVS had bought Oak Street Health, which is a, a primary care uh, solution provider for $10.6 billion. And that's just an add-on to a lot of activity that's going on out there. I mean, most people I think are familiar with Amazon. Three or four years ago, bought a company called PillPack, which is basically a uh, online pharmacy uh, solution, Google purchasing, uh, Fitbit, and a few other things, uh, partnerships they've done with uh, Beth Israel, uh, and other folks, their care studio model that they've worked with, um, Microsoft buying um, Nuance, which is uh, the voice uh, technology company, and then their big play in um, basically cloud computing for healthcare. So when we look at this, there's lots of people and they're in very different sectors doing a lot of unique and different things. Certainly the ones on this slide are demonstrative of the different areas that people are operating in um, and all digital-based solutions. 
So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about um, just some examples here that have come out of Michigan. Uh, I'm going to go through these very quickly. I apologize. Certainly, if you want to know more about them, I'm happy to talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with folks and happy to certainly uh, uh, spend some more time on it. But just to give you a sense of the uh, breadth of digital health solutions that have come out of Michigan, just so you have some sense of what people are doing, that's really what this next section is. The uh, uh, This company, Genomenon, is a genomic literature search engine. It was uh, started by a physician by the name of Dr. Mark Keel, came out of Michigan, and fundamentally, he was looking at genomic uh, literature and saying, you know, the, the challenge I have as a geneticist is there's so much of this out there and I can't get to it all. And fundamentally, what Genomena has built is a thing called Mastermind, and it is a highly curated, very specific search engine that's looking at scientific articles to say what's the state of the art currently to determine clinical care associated with a specific um, type of genetic um, variant or issue. Really, really cool, super interesting company has uh, gone through several rounds of uh, funding and this was developed at Michigan. The original prototype was developed at Michigan. Another uh, startup out of Michigan, which is using sensor data is a company called Fifth Eye. And what they have is what's called an EWS or an early warning system. So they're fundamentally taking huge amounts of streaming data from uh, various sensors that someone would have generally in critical care or even on the floor. And they're evaluating those things to determine uh, if that person is gonna have uh, hemodynamic decompensation type of event. They'll call it hemodynamic instability. So trying to see that before it's coming and then uh, providing signaling to the care team to say, hey, what should we do here? What are the opportunities to intervene? How can we help and make sure that this uh, doesn't become a bigger issue? Obviously easier to uh, help somebody in a preventative way than try to get them out of a very uh, difficult decompensation event. Uh, we have another startup. It's going through a little bit of a change now, but certainly is worth noting is automated scoring of colonoscopy videos. One of the most common procedures done on an out, outpatient basis. The challenging part is, you know, uh, you, you go through that, you have a large video capture, very difficult for any physician to be able to look at every one of those. But what the solution does is in real time, of, uh, we'll evaluate that entire video um, post colonoscopy and then highlight areas that are particularly interesting that should be re-looked at. And it does a couple of different things, quantifies things like lesions or disturbances or ulcers. This is super important with people with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or IBS. And it also geographically uh, highlights where those things are at. So if they come, unfortunately folks who suffer from that, um, have multiple colonoscopies, but allows the physician and care team to be able to go back on a subsequent one and determine if the treatment has uh, resulted in any changes. Angio Insight, another image analysis tool, is basically doing a um, 3D model from a 2D capture during a cath lab activity to determine the total occlusion in a coronary artery, uh, and then as well do what's called FFR or uh, Directional flow reserve. So essentially, what's the flow through that particular uh, set of um, arteries? We're super interesting, something that prior to the computational firepower we have today in digital health wasn't something that could be done, but it's being done on the fly now. And then I mentioned something earlier about really um, operational type of activities. We had a solution called Maze Analytics. Uh, which was, was called ex explanation-based auditing. It's fundamentally determining if everyone who's accessing a health record has an actual legitimate reason to do that. Um, and the example that the company would always use is, you know, if a celebrity were in a hospital, is everybody who's looking at that medical record, somebody who's actually on their car team or care team, or some of those people just curious. Uh, and basically the, the solution that Mays built allowed you to understand explanations automatically as to who was uh, looking at the record and why, and to help manage that and ensure that, uh, you know, only people who had had or needed appropriate access were getting to it. This company was actually acquired a couple of years ago. So it was a startup out of Michigan, uh, ran for several years, and then was acquired. 
Another operational example, example, something that's been developed internally here, basically loss prevention. Um, unfortunately, this is a real problem where, you know, occasionally um, drug cabinet access and um, some of the, the more uh, challenging um, pharmaceuticals disappearing. Uh, it's basically the ability to try and manage what's been used, what's been wasted, what's been returned, and I identify anything that's, you know, abnormal. Then uh, a mobile example, uh, we have a mobile application that's been developed by a combination of engineering as well as a team in psychiatry that fundamentally is passively evaluating the voice of bipolar patients to determine if they may be having a change um, in their care. And, and essentially, it's attempting to determine beforehand whether somebody's going into a manic or depressive episode, a really cool solution. So bunch of different examples there, just intended to give you uh, a couple of key things to think about. There's some things from um, the digital health standpoint that I would point out are certainly key adoption challenges and things we want to be aware of, not the least of which is the FDA is super interested in digital health solutions. Doesn't mean they regulate all of them, but they certainly um, continue to look at things like mobile apps, software as a medical device, the use of artificial intelligence, alerting, early man early warning systems, image analysis, and that becomes a big part of it. Part of the education through FF of My and some of the services that we support here in innovation partnerships is to get an early read on whether what you're building or what you're doing research on um, requires uh, regulatory oversight. And we certainly can help with that. Privacy, huge part of healthcare. Certainly there's legislative activity around that, but there's privacy in the sense of uh, technical restrictions and requirements uh, that are required to ensure that the infrastructure that you're using meets those needs. And then the last two I would mention here are really education. These things are all different. A lot of them are new. They uh, are uh, profoundly different for some of the patients that we're asking to use these things, everything from telehealth to the, the mobile application that I just mentioned to uh, sensors and other things that we're asking people to, to use. So the education on that for, for patients is huge and it's a central part to most digital health solutions, as well as where does it fit in the workflow? How do we get clinical adoption? How do we ensure that these things are actually being used as, as, used as we intend? And then there's uh, a lot of interesting kind of uh, factors with respect to intellectual property and innovation management. We live in a, a world where we want to try to get a uh, kind of secure position from an intellectual property standpoint, usually in the form of patents. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of things that are kind of opposed to that in the form of open science and really open access and open business models where we want to make things freely accessible to people. So creating that appropriate balance there is something that's part of the discussion um, that we try to get engaged with early on to understand what that is. There's no right answer. There's just an answer that's right for your situation. Um, and it's something that we enjoy working through that process with folks. And then, just to summarize that, a lot of that stuff that I just talked about is really the big things that people are talking about now as far as adoption challenges have to do with data rights and privacy. Who owns that data? Who owns the patient's data? How do you manage that in a way that works uh, both from a privacy standpoint, but also helps advance science and care? Uh, there's certainly legislative things around data, uh, such as HIPAA, GDPR, uh, and uh, HIPAA high trust legislation, things of this nature are, are very topical. I don't see them changing uh, at any time in the um, near future. And then when it comes to all of the AI machine learning and uh, associated technologies, there's a lot of discussion about ensuring that what we are actually doing with those models um, is representative. There's lots of concerns about bias based on how the model has been trained and on what data it's been trained on. There's lots of concerns about being overfit or overly sensitive to a specific population or a particular situation. And then of course, going back to the regulatory side, validation is a big part of the discussion. So is this working? Does it continue to work? How does it change over time? And with that, I'm gonna flip uh, the, Reigns over to Dr. Lanham and he can 
um, drive us the rest of the way through. We're happy to, like I say, ask, answer questions and uh, take it from there. Thanks, Drew. So for my piece of this, I'm going to give a little bit of background <clears throat> on who I am and how I got to what I'm doing today, and then tell you guys two stories of two different pieces of software um, that I've been involved in the development of. And then with my associate chief medical information um, officer hat on, just do a little tiny little primer on fire web resources um, to answer a question that came in before the talk about kind of what they are and where they might be useful. And just as Drew was talking about early on about healthcare analytics, it is one of the ways the legislation is helping or has helped improve interoperability and getting data out of the EHR. So just wanted to talk about that a little bit. So next slide, please. Um, so I have been in Ann Arbor since medical school. Um, I did my first resident or my residency in ob Joanne here. And one of my first forays into the EHR space was as the House Officers Association president, being the representative for the House Officers in many of the initial MyChart implementation conversations. And then um, as a fellow in reproductive endocrinology and fertility, um, continued to kind of be the MyChart representative for my division and do some other um, representation there and continue to be interested in the electronic health record. But also this is where I first noted the need for a particular um, improvement in a clinical workflow. I've always been very interested in workflows and making things more efficient, but also patient friendly. And so that's where the idea for OnTrack, which is one of the softwares that I'll talk about in a second came from, and I'll explain uh, more about that in a moment. I started as faculty here in 2014, and as part of my initial um, starting package, had time set aside to be what's called a physician builder which is an epic term for getting training to be able to do specific configuration within Epic. I slowly learned and then got the security to actually do custom programming in Epic as well, and then was able to start a consulting company that I still have where I can do um, custom programming and build for other Epic sites. And during that five-year period, also began to get funding with cardiology to do custom Epic build at Michigan Medicine to support a DOAC dashboard, which is the second project that I'll talk to you about. In 20, middle of 2019, um, I transitioned away from seeing patients directly. And um, now I'm also boarded in clinical informatics, which I forgot to list. Um, all the work I do now is informatics related. And I've flexed my time from being very part-time to less part-time to full-time over the last four years. Um, but I'm currently the associate CMIO um, that covers provider builders, so physician builders as well as APPs that have that same build access that I described, um, custom code and workflows. So anytime we can't get Epic to do something right out of the box, folks can often come to me and we can figure out a way to do it with a little snippet of custom code here and there. And then also I'm the ACMIO who's meant to understand um, the web resources and fire resources and how integrations with other pieces of software may use those to improve either our provider experience or our patient experience or patient safety. I also happen to be the site lead for a new project called NHSN CoLab, um, which is helping the CDC and NHSN create a new piece of software called NHSN Link to reduce the need to do manual uploads of some of the documentation um, and reporting that's required and instead use these same fire web resources. So I've been working with them for a couple of years now, uh, which has helped extend my knowledge of what fire can and cannot do. Uh, next slide, please. So story number one, um, as a fellow in an infertility clinic, you are responsible for overseeing the in vitro fertilization cycles for many different patients. And um, you often also had to do the nurses work when they were on vacation. And so one of the things you learned about earlier creating these calendars, an example of which is on the screen. Unfortunately with fertility cycles, um, as things get started, they immediately um, change from what you think the plan is gonna be uh, with the doses that the patient is gonna take as far as their medications go. And sometimes the ultrasounds and blood draws that you do actually mean that everything even gets pushed out a week or two weeks. And so what I saw happening was the nurses would spend all this time on this Excel spreadsheet and then have to change it immediately. Or what you can see here, the patient might have been given a printed copy and then they would go through and scribble out all the dates and change the dates themselves. And then even a few days in, it was wrong. 
And so what I saw was what I saw, what I thought was a waste of time from the nurse's perspective and then from the patient's perspective on updating this thing manually over and over. And so I wanted to create a solution that would be some sort of dynamic calendar program, potentially on an iPad that would help um, keep this work from having to be done over and over. So that's what I started with. Next slide, please. Um, but early on, I also uh, went and talked to Drew and Office of Tech Transfer, as well as some other advisors there, and learned about this value proposition canvas and understanding the real problem and trying to avoid having a solution that didn't have a problem with it. And so took this model um, and then went and found 14 um, patients and partners and actually talked to them about their cycles. Next slide, please. This is just a little snapshot of, um, this was 11 patients and three partners, and I didn't have really any training on this, but it turned out to be really beneficial to kind of learn it on the fly and sat with them. I had asked them to uh, give me an hour, and many of them wanted to talk for two or more about their cycle and what worked well, what didn't. And I took that prior framework and worked on determining what were the jobs, pains, and gains that the patients had to get through a cycle and then even asked them to help me kind of prioritize features of this future application. And in retrospect, the best thing about doing all of this is there was no programming that happened before any of it. Um, so it was very, very cheap to figure out what the end user might actually care about. And ultimately, I found out things that I hadn't thought about at all when trying to think about this, this dynamic calendar application, that the real problem that patient, from patient's perspective is that they wanted to stay um, to know that they were doing everything right. As you can imagine, folks who are doing an in vitro fertilization cycle usually have infertility. So we're already stressed going into this process. And it is also very common for patients to make medication errors. So to either run out of these meds because they're expensive and hard to keep on hand at home, or they are often from a specialty pharmacy, um, or these are people who haven't had chronic diseases and haven't had it to give themselves medication who suddenly are doing daily medication injections. So about 15% of our cycles have some med error. And even in the setting where clinically you might be able to say probably didn't make a difference for uh, cycles where you really only have at most a 50% success rate, the patients who don't have success, it's hard to convince them that if there was a problem, that it didn't have any implication. And so there's a lot of stress that comes along with this too. Next slide, please. So several things happened relatively soon after that initial customer discovery. Um, there was a hackathon, which I'd never been part of before, but um, somebody told me about it, so I went. And it was um, in Detroit and was meant to be this international hackathon because there were people from um, Canada as well. And um, met, uh, Christina was a nurse in our clinic and I took um, her to the hackathon and then met Alex, who's a developer from Canada. And there was a lot of synergy there and we won several prizes uh, at that hackathon for um, like application most likely to become a real thing um, and had the opportunity to do a boot camp through Spark in Ann Arbor. Uh, next slide. Um, Bef when I thought this was just going to be a dynamic calendar, I'd applied for some FIGS function, or sorry, FIGS funding, and had come up with a spreadsheet based solution. And then off of the hackathon and creating the team and doing more customer discovery, we were able to get two more um, sets of funding with a couple different milestones. Um, the Kickstart funding through Mtrek allowed us to help to use Menlo Innovations. Um, to help us with some rapid low fidelity prototyping. So basically creating some designs on paper. And they also had the benefit of go, being able to go into people's homes and actually watch them do their medication administration without their uh, a physician being nearby, which was very beneficial for getting some more detail on where people were struggling. Um, and then we got additional funding with Mtrak, ran a randomized control trial at um, WashU and St. Louis. Um, Kansas and here, and looked at the number of medication errors and also some stress and anxiety scores over time in patients who are doing cycles, either with um, just tracking things on their own versus using our application. Um, during the RCT, a company called New Bundle reached out and were interested in licensing the technology. So that started in 2019. 
And then so that was licensed by New Bundle through the end of 2020 or so, when they were then unable to raise um, more funding. So that license has reverted back to University of Michigan. Um, but that is in a nutshell, the story from the beginning of a concept, um, having an idea for a piece of software that ultimately we never built a dynamic calendar application. Um, it became much more what the patients wanted was a medication tracker and being able to check off when they had done things. I didn't talk about a particular feature, but we also got an escalation feature so that if patients hadn't checked off during their medications, it could escalate up to the nurses who were doing the study so that we could reach out to them and say, hey, what's going on? Um, we also had transparency onto their medication inventory so that if they were about to run out of medications, we knew as long as they knew. And that was totally novel because we don't, didn't have that functionality before and um, don't have that functionality within Epic today. Next slide. Um, so lessons learned, I've said a couple times, we were successful in avoiding programming a solution that actually wasn't what end users wanted and learned, uh, we're grateful to be able to pivot away from the initial idea if it's not what they wanted. One other lesson learned that I've talked about with folks before is that because of the need to design the product, be able to do the RCT as a milestone of the funding, it did drive us to create a much more functional product um, out of the gate than I would have necessarily if we had been um, kind of a startup outside the university where basically we had people not paying for this. And I would have been interested to run the experiment on what would be the smallest thing people could pay for. Um, but we, we had the opportunity to create more than that. Um, we also had a version that was patient facing that was beautiful. And then the side that was clinic facing that was very much just what we needed to have to be able to have people put in their doses for the day. And that was very intentional because if the patient didn't check off that they had done their work or didn't enter their inventory, that's where all the data was coming from. And so it allowed us to realize we needed to focus on that interface first and make sure that it was useful. Um, and Oh, with the, the last piece is just about the licensing with New Bundle. Um, even though they weren't able to raise funding, and that was ultimately where that license um, agreement disintegrated, there were also some pieces of the culture of the company and the way they did their development and their design um, that I happen to have opinions on. But um, given it was my first time doing it, was very excited about the license happening. I would just ask some different questions next time around um, because. I would have behooved me to know a little bit more sooner rather than later. So that was just my own learning from that particular license agreement. Next slide, please. Okay, so totally flipping gears. Um, as an OBGYN, I don't know that I had ever even had a patient, especially an infertility patient on a DOAC prior to hearing about them um, in around 2017 or 18. But um, given the specialties from uh, which the attendees today are coming from, at least in what I was sent, I think you guys are much more likely to know about these than I was at the time. But direct oral, oral anticoagulants uh, introduced in the early 20 teens as an alternative to warfarin for reducing the risk of things like stroke with AFib or recurrent blood clot after VTE. There are many million users in the US um, and the high utility of it, but also the easy, uh, the ease with which it can be incorrectly dosed due to changes in renal function, um, age, weight, or interacting medications has led to it being the number one class for cause of adverse drug events since 2018. Michigan Anticoagulation Quality Improvement Initiative, or MACI, is one of the CQIs in the state of Michigan funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield. And they had the goal of having something in place in some of their hospitals to be able to um, avoid this problem of a needle in the haystack of about 15% of patients who are on the wrong dose and thus at an increased risk of bleeding or clotting. Um, there at Michigan Medicine alone, there are 12,000 patients that are on this medication on the outpatient side. So it is impossible to conceive of the pharmacist or nurse going through all of those patients individually and looking for um, dosing issues. There was a manual process where a small subset of patients who are on them were being manually abstracted into another database, and they had a way for nurses to identify dosing errors at that time and then reach out to those folks. 
And then the VA had implemented a, a population health dashboard that would calculate expected dose or look for drug-drug interactions or other issues with the dosing. And so based on that fact, um, Mackie via Jeff Barnes reached out to me with what I knew about Epic to say, can we develop something like that in Epic? And so um, with the Mackie funding, we were able to create um, in Epic, the technology happens to be a registry that then filters up to a reporting workbench report that filters up to a radar dashboard, but allows pharmacists and nurses to identify um, the patients who have potential issues or have known issue based on their clinical information in the chart. Because Mackie covers multiple hospitals in the state of Michigan, one of the goals was to be able to kind of create a build playbook um, for other sites to implement that. And we were able to go one step further with Epic's help and use a functionality they have called Turbocharger to actually just move the configuration, which took several hundred hours of build time at Michigan and translated it into about eight hours of active analyst time plus about 10 hours of testing at three other hospitals. So this is now also live at Beaumont, um, or what it was Beaumont, what was Spectrum, and what still I think is Henry Ford. Um, and so there are over 60,000 patients managed annually last year um, for looking for these DOAC issues. So it's really been a boon for um, finding this needle in a haystack. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so that was the beginning. And that is the upper left quadrant of this little two by two table where you imagine um, hospitals that are on Epic and managing their outpatient sites. Um, we also, uh, by word of mouth, other hospitals in the country have found out that we have this functionality and it's not something that Epic um, has at baseline. And so there are several sites in conversations with um, OTT about a license for the initial configuration and then some number of years of support. Um, for updates that need to happen to maintain that. Uh, at the same time, we've gone to Blue Cross Blue Shield and um, gotten funding to create a non-EPIC specific version of this that would use fire resources, and I'll talk more about what that means in a moment, that would allow us to either plug into an EPIC version that doesn't want to have to, to continue to touch the configuration. Um, in the EPIC version, if things change in the package inserts, then right now there is configuration that has to happen in Michigan Medicine, and then I send the changes to the other sites and say, this is what you need to change. And in the fire-enabled version, we would be able to make that process a little more seamless from an Epic analyst's perspective. So we have that funding. Um, we have the design complete and are starting the development now and in intend to implement at least in one site by the end of this year. Through um, the Anticoagulation Forum and FDA, we've also gotten funding to create a similar thing that's EPIC specific on the inpatient side. It will use a slightly different technology in that it'll be patient lists rather than reporting workbench, but going to fill that gap for the 70 to 100, 70 to 100 patients that are on DOAX at any one time inpatient um, rather than pharmacists having to look for those problems daily. And then our um, applying for or looking for funding for a fire enabled EHR version on the inpatient side right now as well. So next slide. So uh, with my ASML hat on briefly, uh, what are fire web resources? Fire stands for fast healthcare interoperability resources. Um, it means both the specification for how the data is meant to be structured as well as the technology of the web resources where um, an outside instance of software can make a call to a patient's EHR or to a provider's EHR and return information about a particular patient or about appointments or about several different pieces of data. Many EHRs have implemented it, and there are a couple different things to know about the versions that are relevant for trying to write software that hits those um, web resources yourself. The DST stands for draft. Um, and then the R um, is the final, is the most recent version. The specifications change over time and are not necessarily backward compatible. But the other thing you might read about are the USCDI versions. So USCDI stands for United States Core Data for Interoperability. They are defined by ONC and they define what the different web resources should expose from the electronic health record, which is meant to then support the ability for one developer to write a piece of software that works with Epic via Fire, and then also with Cerner, and then also with Athena Health, with having to do a lot of rework. 
um, there is a link between implementing those versions. So it uh, behooves Epic to implement those different versions of USCDI so that their EHR is certified. And then it behooves Michigan Medicine or other hospitals to have a certified EHR because of CMS reimbursement. Um, however, we have learned, I've learned through the NHSN project and then with the other projects that we're working on, that everything you would want is not necessarily there in those different versions. And so um, as you begin to do a project, you're going to want to take a look at what the versions offer. And then there are different actually public comment periods um, that anyone could comment as they're putting out these newest new USCDI versions. So hopefully over the next five to 10 years, they'll become more useful than they are now, um, but they're a place to start. Next slide. And then finally, just some other terminology you might read. Um, SMART on fire, SMART stands for what's on the screen. Um, it is essentially, if you think about if you go to a website and they ask you if you wanna log in with your Facebook or your Apple ID, and you use your Facebook password to log into something else, it's the same concept. But instead, you're using your, um, in our world, MyChart password to log into a different product. So that, that uses the OAuth 2 standard for authentication. And it also defines some standards for retrieving the patient data and some bulk data. But at its core, it's really about the authorization authentication. Um, it's not smart like AI smart or any other way you might define smart. It just means how you log into it. Um, CDS hooks are a way for providing essentially alerts to different electronic health records with the same set of data um, or the same logic. Um, but um, the way the vendor gets to control how they're implemented. And so it is, they haven't really taken off particularly well, at least in um, Epic specific sites. And I think partly because the way Epic has implemented what they look like when you get them triggered, but it would be a way for you to have one piece of data spread to different EHRs if you wanted to. But I'm happy to talk offline about what they really mean and how they would be implemented if that were something you'd be interested in knowing. Next slide. Um, I'll try to get through this quickly so we've got some time for questions. Um, very specifically, the USCDI versions um, started with what I think of as significant lack of specificity. So you would imagine if it says something like medications, you might get stuff like the medication order, the prescription, or even on the inpatient side, when the patient received the medications. And in its first version, medication just meant defining penicillin, for example, had nothing to do with patient context. And even the most recent versions of the medication resources that are implemented in Epic don't provide things like the patient got the med in the hospital. And so it makes it difficult to do some of the NHSN CDC work we're trying to do in figuring out things like hypoglycemia due to medication administration. Um, and it all essentially comes down to the fact that vendors don't have to actually implement it in a particular way. And then individual customers um, may also have workflow that puts data somewhere different and then isn't exposed in the fire web resources. So the implementation of this type of software, you have to be um, patient um, with both the vendor and the customer and yourself when you're trying to figure out what data you can get from where. Next slide. And then finally, um, Lessons learning on the second piece of things, uh, being able to support these multiple sites through Mackey has been beneficial for learning the different ways that the Epic customers implement things. And we are also within the Michigan Medicine ecosystem beginning to be able to build support workflows for problems that come up such that when this ultimately gets spun off um, or licensed, we'll already have some of that worked out. Um, it's also been nice to learn that folks want the outpatient dashboard that we've created and get a feel for what some of that might be worth to people uh, will be nice here. And um, I can go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> and then I'll just give a pitch to talking to Drew and his staff early, um, especially about learning to do customer discovery and avoiding doing programming if you're not 100% sure that, that it's the solution, like you know what the problem is. Um, going out and seeing what people are doing, and then being humble enough to identify the difference between what you are assuming and what you actually know, getting low fidelity designs like stuff on paper in front of people to quote use in order to get feedback, and then failing early um, and pivoting your design early rather than putting time into development if you don't know what you're going to design. Next slide.
I'm happy to take any questions or feel free to email me um, after the talk as well. There's a question, Michael, and I think uh, you're probably equipped to answer this one. Could you please elaborate on your statement, avoid trying to create solutions, looking for a problem? Yeah, so um, it, if I go back to my example with OnTrack, where I saw the problem as the fact that people were remaking this calendar and spending time to do that, when I went and talked to the end users of it, I realized that they didn't see the writing over the dates as a problem. They actually kind of liked the writing over the dates in that particular situation because it meant that they knew what was going on, but they still had real problems. They had problems keeping track of their medication, realizing they'd run out at 9 p.m. when you can't go get a new medication. So I, in going and talking to the people um, who were the real users of the, the workflow, I was able to identify those problems. Drew, I might ask you if you don't mind. Can you, uh, although it, can you think of any examples in your career of something similar, um, where people have had this really exciting technology, but are then trying to push it back into a, um, to get it out there without a real problem? <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think there's numerous examples that are you know out there in the workplace that are are just in real life where people things have been built but they could not seem to get off the ground i mean the i i only laugh about this one because some people will be familiar with it apple developed a product called a newton which fundamentally was an ipad but it was about 25 years too early and people just weren't ready for it right so and i, I think that fundamentally goes to the message you're trying to communicate, which is customer discovery is huge, right? Your ideas are are probably um, well-founded, but it's, you know, always amazing what you learn when you talk to people who are potentially the end users going back to the the calendaring function and what's the real problem, right? So uh, talk to people, get that feedback is, is certainly the message. Yeah. John, not sure if there's anything else. I don't uh, think no, works. I was just just going to plug, you know, the FFMI fast pace course for that concept around, you know, speaking to different stakeholders and conducting customer discovery and understanding problems before developing uh, elaborate solutions. So I'll I'll put a link to that in the chat here and give you a chance to to venture over to that website if you have an interest. Um, but happy to answer any questions related to that course uh, that might come up. Um, and we are at about one o'clock. So unless there are additional questions, let me check real quick. Nope. Um, I'll thank you both again for your, your time this afternoon. Um, we really do appreciate it. Uh, both great presentations. I'll remind the audience, we will be sending a copy of the uh, recording as well as, as the slides. And then again, an opportunity for you to fill out an evaluation uh, in an email. Uh, shortly after we get off the call here today. So thank you everyone for, for joining us. Uh, have a great afternoon and the rest of your day.